Now, I want to assure you, uh, this next introduction, most of you know, uh, I know him as a mentor in my own life, a man who is, uh, who's mentored me in gentleness. And being a retired hockey player, I assure you, I needed mentoring in gentleness. But I want to tell you that this past May, Dr. Ed Bulkley preached on the Sunday morning at our church in Clarence, New York, and preached a sermon that knocked our socks off. And I thought he was supposed to be getting old. <laughs> it seems like his preaching is becoming more and more vibrant. And as the Lord continues to use him and with IABC and here at Life Fellowship, but IABC internationally, as I'm sure you'll hear more about throughout the weekend, I'm so thankful to say that this man is most likely, I would say, in my own estimation, the most humble man I've ever met in my life. And I want to introduce him to you to give us the word of God here this evening, Dr. Ed Bulkley. What a, what a sweet testimony, Nathan. Thank you. That was so encouraging. And Nathan is one of our new IABC counselors. We're so proud of him and his family. And uh, we, just, we just thank God for young men like this. We have some wonderful things in store for you this weekend that I, I just pray that God will use it in your life. Uh, tomorrow night, and of course tonight, we have some wonderful workshops. Don't miss out on those. I mean, these are speakers who've come from across the country to share with us, and I'm just so excited to have them here, and I, I pray you'll take advantage of the workshops. And then tomorrow night, we have a special friend of mine who's going to be sharing with us, Dr. Peter Bregan who is a psychiatrist who has been used in many ways to alert many people that psychology, psychology, psychiatry, and psychotropic drugs are very dangerous and are harming lives. You'll want to hear him. If you have any questions about psych meds and the power of psychology, you will want to be here for that. And uh, we have others that throughout the week are going to be sharing. Just take advantage of it. This is one of these conferences that will bless your heart. And our entire purpose in this is to remind you that we need to go back to the ancient paths, the ways that God has blessed people down through the centuries, people who've turned to his word and has found that his word is more than enough to deal with any issue of life. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Jeremiah chapter 6. Jeremiah chapter 6, starting at verse 16. Jeremiah chapter 6, starting at verse 16. We'll be coming back to this passage. Peter, it's so good to have you here. Just got in on the plane. Welcome, Peter Bregan, if you would, please. <laughs> Peter, so good to see you, my friend. And I want you also to welcome some new friends from Brazil. We have a Brazilian contingent here. There they are. Stand up, fellas, would you? Welcome them, if you would. I already consider them precious friends. And we've had a good conversation today. And I, I have to tell you, this is a group that is committed to God's Word. And they believe in the sufficiency of Scripture. And we look forward to a, a long partnership with these people. It's going to be a wonderful thing. So keep them in your prayers. And if you... Uh, can stop and talk with them. You need to have Victor as a translator there because none of us speak Portuguese. And oh, you do speak Portuguese, do you, Paul? You got to you got to get over and talk to them. Paul speaks Portuguese. Marianne, do you speak Portuguese? Oh my goodness! Here, well, you got to spend some time with them. That's all there is to it. <laughs> Jeremiah chapter six, starting at verse sixteen. Would you honor God's holy word by standing with me as I read this passage? Jeremiah chapter 6, starting in verse 16. This is what the Lord says. Stand at the crossroads and look. Ask for the ancient paths. Ask 
where the good way is and walk in it, and you'll find rest for your souls. But you said, we will not walk in it. I appointed watchmen over you and said, listen to the sound of the trumpet, but you said, we'll not listen. Therefore hear, O nations, observe, O witnesses, what will happen to them. Hear, O earth, I'm bringing disaster on this people, the fruit of their schemes, because they've not listened to my words and have rejected my law. Father, help us now. Help us to remember how important it is to keep your word in the forefront of our hearts and minds and to understand that you have given us everything we need for life and godliness. So help us, Father, to depend upon it and not to be seduced by the deception of the world. And we'll thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. I want us to just look for a few minutes first at why the modern world has changed so much. I have seen in these last 10 years such an amazing change in our culture, in our society, and it is in a rapid decline. Things that I did not think were even possible, that I thought never would happen, have just flown into our culture. And what used to be just a blasé ig ignoring of God has become hatred for God. And we see it here in our own city. This is not the Bible Belt, folks. We're, we're in the pagan belt here. And we are up against it when it comes to our social culture roundabout. But God's Word still is affecting lives as we preach it. And we are so thankful for it. But why has our world changed so much? What's made this possible? Well, secular humanism began back in the garden and has continued on since that time but in more recent times Greek philosophers have turned people away from the idea of a God. The French Revolution took place, the pseudoscience of Charles Darwin, Freud and psychologism, intellectual intimidation, political correctness and the church has capitulated to this onslaught of humanism in many cases. The Playboy philosophy has become extremely popular, even though it's not even called that anymore. It's just called normal. Education has turned to leftist doctrines. Left-wing media, social media has taken place that is destroying lives. In April of this year, the Media Research Center founder, President Brent Bozell, discussed the, the topic censored how online media companies are suppressing conservative speech. And he said this, this is the emerging of the greatest censorship of free speech worldwide in the history of man. Now let me explain this, he said. The left is on a jihad against conservative thought. It's happening in academia, entertainment, business, religion, everywhere. Now they're going to the social media giants. These social media giants have audiences in the billions. And what we've shown in this massive report is whether it's Facebook or Twitter or Google or YouTube, they're all employing different tactics to go against conservatives, not just against political conservatives, folks, against the Word of God. The result of humanistic thinking is seen in California, Colorado, Washington. San Francisco, a major example of a beautiful place is being destroyed by humanism as you can't even walk the sidewalks for danger of the needles that have been left there and the excrement that's alongside the sidewalk. California has become a sanctuary state as has, has Colorado also. You don't have to obey the law according to them. Universities have shut down conservative speech and threatened the speakers. Leftists are boycotting companies and broadcasters who dare to think outside the, the humanist box. But worse than those things is the disdain for the Bible in religious circles. The desire to accommodate the Bible to the, to the modern world is reflected in a, in a 2005 document issued by the Roman Catholic bishops from England, Scotland, and Wales. In their article called The Gift of Scripture, the bishops warned that while they consider the Bible true in passages regarding salvation, we should not, quote, we should not expect total accuracy from the Bible in other matters. 
We should not expect to find in Scripture full scientific accuracy or complete historical accuracy, unquote. Even so, the bishops profess a respect for the Scripture, telling their flock, we've rediscovered, rediscovered the Bible as a precious treasure, both ancient and ever new. These double-minded statements reflect the mindset of many theologians today who say that they respect the Bible, but they deny its authority. Psychotherapy has replaced the work of the church. I want to ask you a question. Wouldn't you think that with the explosive growth of psychotherapy over these past 50, 70, 80 years, wouldn't you think that our culture would be in much better shape? People would be happier. Crime would be decreasing. Drug use would decline. Divorces would be rare. Wouldn't you think that would be the result if psychology is the answer? But instead, across the globe, individuals and nations are increasingly troubled. They're increasingly drug-infested, sexually perverted, violent, hate-filled, depressed, and unstable. And you might ask why. And there are five reasons at least. The denial of the existence of God. The dismissal of the Bible and doctrine. Turning away from the church the longing for religious values and experience without God and seeking truth without divine revelation. Let me share with you what America used to be. The foundational items at the Library of Congress, Congress give us a hint. Above the reading room central door to the left is a painting titled Corrupt Legislation Leads to Anarchy where the figure representing anarchy is burning the scroll of learning while she tramples on a Bible. In the main reading room, above a figure of history, it says, one God, one law, one element, one far-off divine event to which the whole creation moves. Can you imagine them putting that up there today? Above the figure of religion is this, what doth the Lord require of thee but to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God? Quoting Micah chapter 6, verse 8. Above the figure of science is this statement, the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament showeth forth his handiwork. The bronze statues along the balustrade of the galleries include Moses and St. Paul. What has happened to our nation that has forgotten all these things? We've turned from worshiping God to worshiping man. 1 John chapter 2, verse 16, For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the boastful pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. The foundational concepts of humanism is that humanism is a progressive life stance that without theism or other supernatural beliefs affirms our ability and responsibility to lead meaningful ethical lives capable of adding to the greater good of humanity humanity. The belief that morality is independent of theology. The affirmation that new moral problems have arisen in modern industrial society which have not been adequately dealt with by the world religions. So it's the duty to engage in philanthropy in the advancement of morality. And it is the job of humanists to engage in the education of the young children as a most important aim. They say modern organized humanism began in the minds of its founders as nothing more nor less than a religion without God. Basically, humanism is atheism cloaked in a mask of self-defined morality. God says this in Psalm chapter 2, verse 1. Why do the nations conspire? And the peoples plot in vain. The kings of the earth take their stand and the rulers gather together against the Lord and against his anointed one. Let us break their chains, they say, and throw off their fetters. The one enthroned in heaven laughs and the Lord scoffs at them. Then he rebukes them in his anger and terrifies them in his wrath, saying, I have installed my king on Zion, my holy hill. Researchers in humanism call it the exchange model of religion. Humanism is, if people can get what they need from the government, be it health care, education, or welfare, they're less likely to turn to a divine power for help. 
Why do you think that socialism is growing here in America? Well, one thing is people have no insight in history. The younger generation and many times have no idea what socialism really is all about. But there's another reason. They want to have their needs fulfilled without having to turn to God because of the conviction of their sin. They've done studies and they found that better government services were in fact linked to lower levels of strong religious beliefs. And the results of humanistic teaching and practice and therapy are sexual perversions, gender confusion, social norms redefined, objective truth rejected, irrational delusional thinking. Folks, it's time to return to the ancient paths. In Jeremiah chapter 6 verse 16 it says, this is what the Lord says. Stand at the crossroads and look. That means observe the life around you. Look intentionally. What do you see? What I see is a world deliberately ignoring God. A world of growing hatred and violence and immorality and idolatry. The church turning to the world. The church questioning the Bible. Ignoring the Bible. Seeking answers and authority from godless men. He says, ask for the ancient paths. Ancient does not mean outdated. It doesn't mean irrelevant. But it's God's way that we're to follow. And he says, ask where the good way is and walk in it. Think about that. Ask where the good way is and walk in it. The good way is God's way, the biblical way. And you only find the good way in the Bible. You'll find it requires intentional searching through the Scripture to find the good way. Richard Wormbrand, who uh, suffered greatly in Romania under the communists, said this, God is the truth. The Bible is the truth about the truth. Theology is the truth about the truth about the truth. You need to know God's word. You'll find it requires this intentional search. And the fruit of wisdom found in scripture is found in Proverbs 8 verse 19. My fruit is better than fine gold. What I yield surpasses choice silver. So walk in it. James 1 verse 22 says, don't merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Ephesians 4 verse 1, Therefore I, the prisoner of the Lord, implore you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you've been called. And he says, if you do that, you'll find rest for your souls. I was at one of our large shopping centers one day on a technical problem. I had to take in my phone. And I was walking up while I was waiting for it to be fixed. As I walked past this clothing store, I saw a sign and the sign was a young woman standing there with the title near her, near her. It said, Comfort in your soul. Clothing was going to provide comfort in your soul. God's word says that you'll find peace for your soul. You'll find that God is able to deal with the problems and you'll find rest for your souls. Matthew 11 verse 29 says, Take my yoke upon you. Learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you'll find rest for your souls. These are God's promises. I was lecturing early this year in Romania on depression. It wasn't what I had planned to teach on, I think, and, and I, I really don't know exactly why I decided to do that, except the Lord impressed it upon me. And I began to teach on Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 and 7. Don't be anxious about anything. But in everything, by prayer and supplication or petition, with thanksgiving, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God which transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. And I began to share about that. I didn't know how it would be received because... There are some psychologists and psychiatrists in the church in which I was speaking. 
A lady came up to me after the service, and normally when someone comes up and tells me they're a psychologist or psychiatrist, I know I'm in for a battle. And I took a deep breath when she said, I'm a psychiatrist, I teach in the local university. And I said, yes. She said, I wonder if you'd be willing to come and teach in my class and teach these young people how to find rest for their souls. I just thought how gracious God is to open up her heart. One pastor came up to me after that service and said that was so courageous to talk about overcoming depression through God's word. And I thought, what is courageous about teaching God's word in God's house? But so many people look at it that way. And I'm hoping to go back and to be able to teach her. In fact, we were able to get into five churches while we were there to teach on this subject. And in several of the churches, they said, please, please come back. We need this teaching on the sufficiency of God's word. Folks, it's God's word that gives rest to the soul. We make no apology for the scriptures. We were in Uganda and we, with Tom and Patty who are here from California. They're with OIC and such sweet partners. We just, where are you, Tom and Patty? There they are. We had more fun with them. Patty's a kook. And, and, and Tom keeps her, you know, kind of lined up. They are a perfect pair. And they became such precious friends. And we were in Uganda teaching in this, well, first we taught in university for a time, and then we went up to SOS, which is a mission. And SOS stands for suffic Sufficiency of Scripture. I just loved it. And they've built a large mission there. Shannon Hurley has. And we're in this, uh, this large uh, pavilion. And we had 415 pastors and wives and, and other church people there listening to God's word. Five different languages were being translated simultaneously. That is a trip, I have to tell you. They, uh, we'd, we'd say a phrase or so and they would translate and you'd hear it all over the place. And it was so precious to share with them that God's word is what people need. It's not psychology they need, not the promises of mankind, not the solutions of drugs. What they need is to find a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. And it was such a wonderful time. You see, spiritual rest can also provide physical rest. Proverbs 14, verse 30 says, A heart at peace gives life to the body, but envy rots the bones. In chapter 4, verse 21 of Proverbs, do not let God's words out of your sight. Keep them within your heart, for they're life to those who find them and health to a man's whole body. In, in our uh, elder years here, as, as Bob likes to remind me, he calls me his dad. <laughs> Okay. I must have had him when I was very, very young. But I, I look at these, these elderly years that we've come to, and I'm stunned with God's blessing on our health. Marla and I have traveled around different countries this last few years, and uh, we still have three international trips yet this year. And people have asked, how are you doing this? And I just have to tell you, God gives health to the bones. His word gives strength. That's not to say that those who are hurting and don't have that strength are not in God's will. It's just that God's sovereign will for this time, he's given us health. And we praise him every day when we're able to get out of the bed without pain. He's been so good to us. But I do believe part of it is that God has protected us through his word 
over these years. We find there's a price for rebelling against God's word. Verse 16, the second half says, but you said we will not walk in it. God appoints watchmen to help you. Verse 17, I pointed watchmen over you and said, listen to the sound of the trumpet. And what IBC is trying to do is to call people back to the word of God. Wherever we go, we're trying to share with them, come back to scripture. You want healing for your soul? Come back to God's word. Don't be fooled by the so-called science of the mind. The, the, the things, in fact, in Colossians chapter 2, verse 8, he tells us to be so careful about the deceitfulness of the world. And don't let this hollow and deceptive philosophy creep in, he says. So God has appointed watchmen, and the people who are here to teach are trying to shout out to people, listen to God's word. And God warns loudly, listen. God is not trying to make this a secret. He warns loudly, listen to the sound of the trumpet. This is a warning call of God that we're going to hear during the time described in the book of Revelation. But most people refuse to listen. You said, we will not listen. I mean, we're active in rebellion. We're, and in some cases, it's passive, just in pretended innocence. But it's still the same thing, saying, I will not listen. And the results of abandoning the ancient path of Scripture is found in verse 18 and following. Therefore, hear, O nation, Observe, O witnesses, what will happen to them. Hear, O earth, I'm bringing disaster on this people, the fruit of their schemes. And I was talking about Israel at this time, but he's also talking about our world today and what will happen when we turn from God's word. The results of abandoning the ancient path of Scripture is earned disaster, and people will receive the fruit of their rebellion. First of all, there's spiritual decline. I'm bringing disaster because they've not listened to my words and rejected my law. Romans chapter 1 at verse 18 talks about the spiritual decline. It says the wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of men who suppress the truth by their wickedness since what may be known about God is plain to them because God has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made so that men are without excuse. For although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor give, gave thanks to him, but their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools. Do you see this happening today? You see when they're trying to tell us that boys can be little girls and girls can be boys, it doesn't matter, it's just how you do Does that not strike you as sheer foolishness? They became fools. That's what we're seeing in our world today. In Romans chapter 1, verse 29, they become filled with every kind of wickedness, evil, greed, depravity. They're full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, and malice. They're gossip, slanderers, God-haters, insolent, arrogant, and boastful. They even invent ways of doing evil. They disobey their parents. They're senseless, faithless, heartless, and ruthless. And there are physical consequences to this rebellion as well. Romans chapter 1 verse 24 says, Therefore God gave them over in the sinful desires of their heart to sexual impurity for the degrading of their bodies with one another. And along with that comes the sexual diseases that are sweeping across our nation now. Here's a statement made by a man who was trying to support the idea of homosexuality while claiming to be a Christian. He wrote an article, Why Romans Doesn't Condemn Homosexuality. He said, if we lay aside our inherent bias against gay sex, we can see that Paul's entire point is that the denial of God and the worship of idols through sexual intercourse, gay or straight, is what is shameful. Not the type of sexual intercourse itself. Sexual intercourse in the worship of idols is evil. That's Paul's entire point. No, friend, that's not Paul's entire point. He is saying that there is a consequence for dishonoring God by ignoring the truth of nature itself as well as the Word of God. Nature itself teaches us that male is different from female, and God has planned male and female for the purpose 
of not only having fellowship as husband and wife, but for procreation. God has made it plain. It's so obvious. I don't want to be gross, but I was teaching in Germany at one time, and I came to that passage, and I said, folks, you don't have to be a scientist to understand that man is man and woman is woman and God has made a plan. I said, all you need to be is a plumber. And my interpreter looked at me and said, plumber? I said, plumber. He translated it. There was a slight titter in the audience, but I know it sounds gross, but folks, I'm telling you, nature itself teaches us there is male and female, and God has planned it that way. We need not be fools to ignore it. Transgenderism is sheer nonsense, and they claimed to be wise, but they became fools. Furthermore, since they didn't think it worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God, he gave them over to a depraved mind to do what ought not to be done. And we read about the social consequences of wickedness that is destroying our nation. The violence that we are seeing in our nation today has come as a direct result of turning away from God. The carelessness about human life. The murder of innocent babies. Whether they do it in the womb or outside the womb, and they destroy their life. And you think that God is going to ignore this? I tell you, our nation is going to pay an incredible price for this and is doing so even now. But there's psychological consequences as well. Counseling according to fraud is, is described in the negative in 2 Corinthians chapter 10 at verse 3. It's described there as waging war the way the world does. It's described as the weapons of the world. But 2 Corinthians 10 verse 3 says, For though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, the weapons of God have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God, and we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. That's the ancient path that leads to peace and rest for the souls. 2 Corinthians 10 verse 12 says, We do not dare to classify or compare ourselves to some who commend themselves. When they measure themselves by themselves and compare themselves with themselves, they're not wise. Comparing man to man is not wise. God says that we're to compare ourselves to the Lord Jesus Christ and see how short we have fallen of God's goal. Then you'll see what happens. Then you'll see your need by turning to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why the gospel is so important. That's why we want to teach people the way to find peace in this world, the way to overcome depressions, the way to overcome PTSD is to return to the Lord Jesus Christ, to allow him to become your source of joy, to allow him to teach you through his word. His word, both Old and New Testament, is filled with the treasures for the soul, how to live for him, how to live with him, how to find the peace of God that passes all understanding. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, rejoice, he says. Oh, Philippians chapter 4 is, I call it the medicine cabinet of the counselor. Turn there with me for just a moment. Philippians chapter 4 is such a passage that we need to remember. God's word has given us this so that we can be encouraged so that we can be blessed. And I'm going to read this. I, I'll move it back to the NIV so we don't confuse our project, projectionists here. But Philippians chapter 4, starting in verse 4. This is, this is where we tell people to go. We, uh, years ago, I had a call from, from Georgia, I believe it was, somewhere out in the, in the east and the south from two pastors who were working with a woman who uh, suffered from, um, she had all kinds of uh, panic attacks. Thank you, love. That's my wife I'm talking to. And they said, how can we help her? You've told us 
that God's word has a solution for everything. How can we help her? And I said, well, will she do what you tell her to do? If some of you have heard this story, I apologize, but it's, it's such an encouraging one. They said, yes, I think she'll do what we tell her to do. What would we say to her? I said, I want you to ask her to memorize Philippians chapter 4 through verses 9 and then also verse 11, 13, and 19. I want her to memorize it so she can say it word perfect. I said, would you tell her that? I said, well, we'll ask her if she'll do it. She agreed to do it, and I said, now listen, when she does this, you tell her whenever her panic attacks start, she's to start quoting her verses out loud. That's why she needs to memorize it word perfect so she doesn't stumble. Have her memorize it. And then when the panic attack starts, you have her quote her verses out loud. And then in a few weeks, I want you to call me back and tell me how it's going. So he said, okay, we'll do that. So she agreed to do that. She memorized it perfectly. And uh, a few weeks later, I talked with him, and, and I asked if I could do a radio broadcast with this lady. So she agreed to come on. I said, tell me your story. She said, well, I agreed to memorize the verses, and I did memorize them, and, and then I started having a panic attack, and I, I'm sitting in the back of a car. Someone else is driving, and I'm feeling kind of foolish because I'm quoting these verses out loud. And they think I'm having a seance back there or something. I'm talking to myself. But she said, I had agreed to do it, so I started quoting my, my verses. And she said, it took a half an hour before there was any effect at all. But eventually, my panic attack subsided. She said, I don't think that's very effective, but I'll keep trying. So she said, the next time a panic attack happened, I started quoting my verse out loud quickly, and she, she was timing it. She said, I found... After about 28 minutes, it went away. And so the next time it happened, she started quoting your verses, and she said, after 25 minutes, it stopped. And pretty soon, she said, it was down to 22 minutes, and then down to 18 minutes, and then down to 15 minutes, down to 12 minutes, down to 10 minutes, down to 8 minutes, and down to 5 minutes. And she said, after that, when I would start feeling it coming on, I'd start quoting my verses, and it would stop before it ever hit me. And you say, well, you're just retraining her mind. <laughs> What's wrong with that? Of course we're trying to retrain her mind, but more than that, we're trying to get her soul dependent on God's word. We have seen lives transformed. Those of you in biblical counseling have seen lives transformed by the power of God. It's a joy to watch that happen. It says this, rejoice in the Lord always. I'll say it again, rejoice let your gentleness be evident to all because the Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God and the peace of God that passes all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. And finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, whatever is excellent or praiseworthy, think on those things. Do you know what that's saying? Set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth. Set your eyes on Christ, not on things on the earth. That's what he's saying. Whatever you have received and learned and received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice and the God of peace will be with you. Verse 11, I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. You say, how can I do that? How can I be at peace? What, what is it in your view of God that you believe God's word can give you peace? First of all, it's understanding who God is. God is our creator. He has made us. He has made you specifically. He has made you. You say, I don't understand that. Well, neither do we. I don't understand why he makes us the way we are with all of our problems. And you say, well, God's not responsible for that sin. You're exactly right. He's not, but he still has made us. And he loves us. And something that you need to understand, this is so powerful. Oh, I wish I could communicate this to you well 
if you understand the sovereignty of God. Folks, God is in control. God has everything under control. When disaster sweeps into your life and you think, what's going on? If you understand the sovereignty of God, you can look it in the face and say, my God is bigger than this circumstance. When I see some of our ladies who have lost their husbands suddenly, unexpectedly, and I've watched how they're dealing with this, and because they believe in the sovereignty of God, I've watched them walk through this valley of the shadow of death and have watched the smiles on their faces. Oh, there's pain in their heart, but God is bigger than their pain because he's sovereign. That is, he's in control. Nothing can touch your life as a child of God without first going through the hand of God. Doesn't mean he created anything that is bad. He is not. God never tempts us, never tempts us to sin. But our God will bring you through if you understand who he is. The peace of God that passes all understanding. I have a dear brother who's here with us tonight who went through a trial at his church that was so severe. He was sued by former members of the church trying to destroy his ministry and the church. And I, I watched him endure that for years as he went through this process. And I've watched the joy in his heart because he found that God is more than enough. Am I right? God is more than enough. I've watched people in our church go through times of questions, times of sorrow, times of disease, times of injury. And I've watched them be victorious because they believe that God is able. And they've learned to be content in all their circumstances. And he tells us in verse 19, verse 13, I'm sorry, I can do everything through him who gives me strength. Is that your testimony? I can do everything through him who gives me strength. I can't do it in my own strength. There's so many questions that come into our life and we wonder, how can I deal with this? This emergency, this problem, this betrayal, these lies that are being told about me, how can I get through this? But our sovereign God says, I will give you strength and I'll give you peace because, child of God, I'm still in control. The peace of God that passes all understanding. I can do everything through him who gives me strength. Verse 19, my God will meet all your needs according to his glorious riches in Christ Jesus. Do you see the promises that God has given to us? They're glorious, dear friend. There is nothing that he cannot bring us through. You say, well, Christians still die. Of course they do. Do you not understand? That's when you finally graduate to full and complete and total healing. That's when you're finally home with the Lord forever. That's when you get to see the glories of heaven that you've read about in Scripture and others have told you about. That's when you get to see the face of the Lord Jesus as he greets you into your new home. That's when you get to hear the angels in their chorus of glory. That's when you get to see the millions of believers down through the ages standing there giving praise to God and you get to join with them and someone would tell us it's a tragedy of death. <laughs> it's glorious to be home with the Savior. That's why a genuine believer in Christ can face aging and death without fear I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me dear ones listen this is the solution ask for the ancient paths ask for the good way walk in it and you'll find rest for your souls this is what biblical counseling is all about we're sharing the ancient paths, the good way, how to walk in it, how to find rest for our souls. 
what you're offering is a treasure that can never be bought. It comes through faith in Jesus Christ and a walk with him. Biblical counseling is ministry of the gospel, not only to those who come in as unbelievers, but to the saints of God who need to be reminded you have everything you need pertaining to life and godliness through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. Hallelujah. Let's pray. Father, how we thank you that you've provided everything we need, everything we need through your word, everything that we need for this life and the life to come, every sorrow, every disappointment, every disease, every disability we can face because of our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and the power of Almighty God. We thank you, we praise you through the name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen. Amen. God bless you.